I'm with Michael Mistretta from uh, Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries, and we're looking about uh, the Jewish holiday of Passover. Now, Michael, what is Passover? Passover is one of my favorite holidays. In Hebrew, we call it Pesach, and it's written about the Passover, the Paschal Lamb that would be slain, and it was, talks about the deliverance of the Is- Israelites, the Jewish people, from the land of Egypt, from slavery. And I think it's something that so clearly mirrors our own Christian faith, our own walk with the Lord, because God's used this as an imagery and an example to talk about our own um, freedom and deliverance from sin and from slaves. And God releases the Israelites, sends plagues on the Egyptians. Finally, Pharaoh agrees to let the people go. And God parts the Red Sea, allows the Jewish people, the Israelites, to pass in safely and delivers them with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand and leads them into the wilderness where they can worship him. And then later we have the giving of the Ten Commandments and eventually the leading to the Promised Land. So this is, it's a very important holiday that comes up. Usually it's around March or April every year, and it lasts for a whole week. Is this a strong biblical holiday? Yes, yeah, it's a strong, strong biblical holiday. It's not only one of the seven feasts of the Lord that you'd read about in Leviticus 23. It's part of one of the three pilgrimage feast where the Jewish people were required every year, no, no matter where you were, if you were living in Israel or outside of Israel, to come up to Jerusalem. They, they, it would be one of the feasts they would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate there. And the other two of those would be the Feast of Booths, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall, and the Feast of Weeks, which is later in the spring, summertime. And that's just an interesting connection. Later when we talk about the Feast of Weeks, that was why when Jesus died and rose from the dead. It said there were Jews from all the diaspora, from all over the world that were gathered in Jerusalem. They weren't just there for a birthday party. They weren't just there randomly. They were there because it was a a pilgrimage feast where they were required to come up to Jerusalem. So Passover is the same thing. Everyone would come and celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And that's not unlike what Jesus and his disciples did. Yeshua, Jesus, came with his disciples and he said, I have longed to celebrate the Passover with you in Jerusalem. So do people actually come to Jerusalem today specifically to celebrate Passover? You know, the religious ones do. So in, in our day and age, not everyone will, especially in Israel. It's as, as in anywhere else, it's become a very cultural holiday. So it's very familial. It's something that the first night of Passover specifically, you, you get together with your family or extended family. But there are a lot of the religious that will come up and stay in Jerusalem. And uh, there's another reason as well. People, some people stay in hotels the whole week of Passover. The Passover is eight days altogether, and during this time, God commands us as a reminder not to eat leavened bread. It's a reminder that the Israelites had to leave in such a hurry from Egypt that they weren't able to wait for their bread to leaven, to rise. And so we eat only unleavened bread, and you're not allowed to have any leaven in your house, in your dwelling place at all. So that means these weeks leading up to Passover, everyone is cleaning everything. And if you're really religious, you get it cleaned and certified by a rabbi. You've got to look inside your toaster for every little crumb, inside the bottom of your oven, inside your stove, because you don't want to have any leaven there because obviously it's against, it breaks the mitzvah, it breaks the commandment. But some people choose, well, instead of cleaning all my house and doing all that work, I'm just going to stay in a hotel for the week because technically that's my dwelling place for the week. So they'll, they'll move all out. Some people, some religious, will sell all of their leavening, all of their uh, wheat products to a Gentile. They'll sell it to a Gentile for a week and then buy it back. And, and they'll put it in a corner in their pantry and say, this is now owned by so-and-so Gentile, and that's my way of doing it. But, but the heart behind it is for... It to serve as a, as a visual, tangible reminder. So in Israel, it gets really fun here because all the places, your burger shops, they won't, if they're kosher, they won't serve any normal burgers. They'll sell gluten-free, leaven-free version of it, and we'll eat something called matzah. Matzah is an unleavened bread agent. It's something that's part of the Passover celebration as well. Mm. And what will you see in Israel during Passover? Well, during Passover, a lot of people have the week off. So a lot of things are going to be closed. Technically, only the first day and the last day of Passover are holidays. But often during the week, people go on vacation. They spend a lot of time with family. On the first night and the last night, they have the Seder meal. Or in Hebrew, it's Seder. That's how you pronounce it. And Seder is just a Hebrew word that means order. And basically, it's a very orderly and structured meal. And when we say meal, we mean you get to eating about two hours in. 
So it's there's a whole order to the meal where you go through different elements. You ask different, and you involve the children. And all of this again is the heart of how do we pass down to another generation the remembrance that we were slaves in Egypt and now we've been freed. And so one of my favorite parts of the Passover is at the beginning of the Seder, you would read from Exodus chapter six because God makes four I am promises to the Israelites at the beginning of Exodus 6, 6. And he says, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment. And I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And so th- these four I will statements really are symbolized in the four cups of Passover. So part of any Seder meal, over the course of the two, three hours, you're drinking four cups of wine. And these cups all represent different aspects of what God's done. The the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, the cup of judgment towards the Egyptians. And they're all remembering different aspects of God. And depending on how your family is wired or orientated, you can be more interactive with some of these. So last year for the Passover that we celebrated in Israel, we really wanted to involve the kids. And so we acted out all of the 10 plagues. We came up with, you know, boils, little stickers that you put all over the kids because the, the spirit of Passover is to pass it down to the next generation, the remembrance of what God has done. What foods do they have on the Passover plate? So on the so they have a Seder plate, and on the Seder plate you have a bunch of different foods. You have some bitter herbs. Why do you have bitter herbs? Well, in Exodus chapter 12, when you're reading about the Passover, it says we, we eat the bitter herbs to remind ourselves of the bitterness and the oppression that our people were under in, in Egypt. We also dip some parsley that kind of represents a hyssop branch, which they use to spread blood over the mantle of their doors. We dip that in salt water to remember tears, the tears of our people. You have a bone from a Passover lamb, from a a shank bone, a lamb shank bone. And this is in reminder of the Passover lamb that had to be slaughtered and killed and whose blood was put over the mantle so that the firstborns would be saved. The whole term Passover comes from that last judgment. Once we get through the 10 different plagues that the Lord put on the Egyptians, the last one was the death of the firstborn. But God chose to save his people. And he said, you can be saved if you take a lamb that's without spot, and without blemish, and you slaughter it and you take the blood of that lamb, you put it over the mantle of your door and you eat all of the lamb that night. And all the families that did that, the angel of death passed over their house and their firstborn sons were saved and spared. And so I think that's a powerful analogy for us as Christians because that's, that's very, very similar to how Paul and how Jesus interprets what happens in the new covenant. Jesus says, as he's leading the Passover meal with his disciples, he breaks the matzah bread, the unleavened bread, and says, this is my body broken for you. He drinks the the wine, one of the cups, one of the four cups from Passover. And he says, this is my blood, which is shed for you. New covenant in my blood. Paul says, Yeshua, Jesus is our Passover lamb. What does he mean by that? Does he mean Jesus is the one that we kill and eat on Passover? No, he's not talking about that. He's saying Jesus is our Passover lamb. His blood is wiped over our sin in our hearts. And that's what causes God's judgment, God's wrath to pass over us because he's a Passover lamb. And I think there's a lot of meaning and a lot of symbolism here. And one of of my favorite things to look at with Passover is if you compare the accounts of Exodus 12, the, the, the accounts of the Passover with what happened with Jesus, it's just, it's just really stunning and beautiful. God, God commanded the Jewish people on the 10th day of the month of Nisan to select a lamb. And on the 10th day of the month of Nisan, Jesus, Yeshua, marched into the old city of Jerusalem, marched into Jerusalem for the triumphal ent- entry. We call it Palm Sunday, where there's a, everyone's shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna, son of David, and they're waving palm branches. Well, that was actually the 10th day of the month of Nisan. That was when the, the very day that the Passover lambs would have been selected. And there's actually evidence that Jesus walked through the same gate that the lambs would have been walking through. And he says he went to the temple. That's where the lambs would have gone. And then if you notice that whole week, we call it in Christianity, Passion Week, Jesus was in the temple. And it says people were were uh, listening to him and seeing if there was any flaw in what he was saying, how they could, how they could incriminate him because they were trying to kill him before the Passover. But it said they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Well, why is this significant? 
Well, with the Passover lambs, you're supposed to inspect the lamb for four days. So you're supposed to bring it into your house and inspect it. Make sure there's no blemish, no spot. It was a blameless lamb. And that's exactly what we see happen with Jesus. Mm-hmm. That for four days, he's in the temple. They know him. They're looking. Are there, is there anything wrong with him? Is there something that we can you know, use to, to incriminate him? And they couldn't find anything wrong. They went back to the Pharisees several times. There's nothing wrong. And then we see at the very moment on the eve of Passover, on the preparation day, as we see Jesus was crucified in between in the afternoon, around three o'clock in the afternoon, that actually would have been around the time that the high priests in the temple were killing the Passover lamb for the slaughter. So we see all of this parallel and symmetry, and we see that Jesus is actually mirroring and he's, he's saying through the timing of events that I am the Passover lamb, not just of you, the Jewish people, but of the world. My blood was shed so that God's judgment doesn't have to be on anyone. I think that's one of the most powerful things about Passover that we see that, that parallel to Yeshua and to Jesus and to see that it was actually written about him. And God asked us to celebrate these appointed times, not the Jewish feast, not the Israelis feast, but the Lord's feast, because it's saying something about God that he wants us to know. Also, during the, the Passover meal, they have some bread as well, and they have to hide the bread, don't they? Co- correct. So during the Passover meal, there's three pieces of matzah. So it's unleavened bread, and you have those set on the table. And there's one piece. So some, some would say that there's symbolism between the three. It symbolizes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some would say it symbolizes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're from a Christian tradition, obviously the Jewish people wouldn't think that. But there is a tradition that where they take the second piece of matzah so the one in the middle and you break it in half and you take one of the halves and you wrap it up and you hide it away till the end of the meal and then at the end of the meal you get the kids involved they're all tired you tell told the whole story and you say who can find the afikomen the this piece that was hidden that was hidden away and they run and they find the piece that was hidden and that's that's essentially dessert it's unleavened bread for dessert but they find it they unwrap it and that's part of the game But there is symbolism there that if we as believers think that it represents the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these three pieces of matzah, matzot, then the second piece representing the Son, his body was broken. As Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. And they wrap it in this white linen, white cloth, just like Jesus was wrapped when he was was crucified and as he died. And it was hidden away until after the meal, until after a certain number of times where it came back. And it was actually the end of the feast. And it was this time of rejoicing and sweetness and dessert. So there's all these symbolism. There's, there's so much symbolism and, and parallels with Passover. If you have never celebrated a Passover Seder or Seder, I'd encourage you to do that. Lots of churches do that all over the world. I and mean, maybe you can even join a Jewish family as they do a Passover because there's so much symbolism between Yeshua's story, Jesus's story, and the story of the Israelites being freed from slavery. So is it the story of Passover that they read during the Passover meal? Yeah, so the, so the, during the Passover meal, they have a lot of different prayers, a lot of different things in the structure. But the main part of the meal is called, is the retelling, the retelling of the Passover story. And so everyone, when they come to a Passover meal, on every plate, usually there's a, a Haggadah. And a Haggadah is basically saying the, the telling, it's the story. And you would read through the story, everyone would be involved reading the story. And that's what makes a Passover meal so long, is that you have this interactive st- storytelling happening during that time. And there's so much of Jesus in the, in the whole lot, isn't there? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a very clear example of him. And I really believe that, that Jesus has a, a meaning and an appointment and a timing for all the different feasts. I mean, he was crucified on the Feast of Passover. He was buried and, and, and on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was raised on the Feast of First Fruits, And the Spirit was sent on the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. So those are just four of the Jewish feasts that are in the spring. And then we have this long summer period where there's not any feasts. And we get to then the fall where there's a three high holidays, the three major Jewish feasts in the fall. And I believe right now in the history of the world, we're kind of in that middle summer period. We've had the first four, the spring feast, have all been fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. But as we're coming to a second coming, eventually, when Jesus comes back for a second time, I really believe he will fulfill those three remaining feasts because he is a God of order. He's a God of structure. And he says, these are my appointed times. Uh, what's your prayer for Jews as they celebrate Passover this year? My prayer is that as we celebrate this, this feast, it would not just be a story 
that we would really remember that we were slaves in Egypt. And God is a God of deliverance. God is a God of redemption. God is a God of salvation. God is a God who blots out our sins the same way that the blood of a lamb over Passover could keep God's judgment from us. Well, actually, Yeshua is the Passover lamb. And I pray that our people here in Israel around the world would see that the veil would be torn on eyes this year. And then especially if they know a Christian or they know a Messianic Jew, a Jewish believer that is celebrating the Passover, there would be a provoking to jealousy because they would see how much more it means for us. And they might say, well, you don't have any Jewish background. You weren't, your ancestors were enslaved in Egypt. But you can say, well, I, I identify more with this because while I may not have been a slave to, in Egypt, I, I, I was a slave to sin and to darkness. And, and God, by sending me his Passover lamb, freed me. And I can celebrate the same freedom you can celebrate by being freed from Egypt because I have the fullness of it. And I just pray that, that, that those eyes would be open, that we would be good, faithful witnesses to him and to Yeshua as our Passover lamb. Amen. Okay, Michael, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul.